So I will wait for a few seconds. People comes in the room and attend this session also on, uh, on YouTube. Um, okay, so yeah, still people coming in the Zoom session. Okay, so great. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, during this uh, Europe and AI week, we have a 99 session uh, on various aspects. But uh, as you know, uh, ethics is one of the most important uh, debates uh, we have. And we have the pleasure uh, now to welcome uh, Professor Lode de Lowart from KU Leuven. Uh, Lode, you are a professor in ethics and philosophy of technology uh, in the working group philosophy of technology at the KU Leuven. You are also an author. Uh, you published last year Way Robots. Um, that is quite successful uh, because you are nominated for the best book uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands and, and Belgium. Uh, on the, the on the in philosophy, so that's super, and you have so so much success that we hope we will see soon a documentary also about mm -hmm. uh, about your book. So you have the floor. I, I suggest you present uh, what you prepared for 35, 40 minutes. Then we can have a discussion and interaction also with the audience. I leave you the floor. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Nathanael. Um, before I start my uh, presentation, uh, let me, uh, do you understand me well? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, well, I'll, I'll talk for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes uh, on artificial intelligence, of course, but from an ethical, philosophical perspective, um, um, from ethics and AI. And I'll focus on one of the uh, items that is related to AI and ethics, namely uh, moral responsibility. I'll come to that within a couple of minutes. Um, before I start with that, uh, so indeed my name is Lode, work at the Institute of Philosophy at the KU Leuven, uh, ethics and philosophy of technology and specifically uh, artificial intelligence. If you have any kind of questions um, related to this um, lecture, to this presentation, you have other kinds of questions, you can always send me an email, lode.lawart at kuleuven.be. Or you can also um, send me an email if you're interested in my book. Uh, there's about a discount of about 35%. So I can, uh, I can send it to you. If you send me a small email, then I can send you my book uh, for about the price of about 20, 20 euros. We are robots. Uh, in philosophy, it's a black of technology and artificial intelligence. We robots, a philosophical look at um, technology and AI, artificial intelligence. Okay. Um, so what is central in the book is uh, I have three chapters um, and the first chapter is about, so every chapter is about a specific thesis and uh, a specific thesis that is deeply rooted in uh, human consciousness. Um, what I do in every chapter, I have a threefold structure in every chapter. So first I, I try to clarify uh, the meaning of the thesis. So if I, if I focus, for example, in, this, in the first um, in the first chapter on the neutrality thesis, the, the idea, the thesis, the conviction that technology is something that is neutral. First, I try to clarify what the meaning of this thesis is. What do we mean when we, when we say that technology is something that is neutral? Second, um, I have a more um, non-descriptive evaluation of the thesis. I give the arguments. What are the arguments in favor of the thesis? What are the arguments that try to uh, discuss and tackle or try to tackle the, the thesis? What are the arguments contra the thesis? And lastly and thirdly, I also try to, in every chapter, I try to explain what the relevance is of knowing that a specific thesis is um, correct or wrong. Um, that is a threefold structure of every chapter. So in the first chapter, I focus on the neutrality thesis, the idea that um, Technology is, is not laden with um, moral values, moral values such as sustainability, privacy, autonomy, respect, et cetera, et cetera, fairness, uh, et cetera. 
Um, that's a very, let's say, small interpretation of the neutrality thesis. And also focus on a broader interpretation, which is about the idea that technology is detached from not only moral values, but also from ideology, from norms, from perspectives, etc., etc. Between brackets, I'm not going to focus on this um, thesis in my presentation. I think that the neutrality thesis is at least for about 75% um, not correct. I think that at some technologies are neutral, but most technologies aren't neutral. The last and the third chapter, I focus on the also deep-rooted conviction that um, the, both the, the, the existence and also the, um, the evolution of technology um, is inevitable. That the existence and the evolution of, of technology has a necessary char character. It cannot be otherwise than this or that technology um, exists or that evolve, um, um, that there's some kind of evolution between several kinds of um, technologies. Um, I think that every kind of interpretation of this, what I call determinism, determinism thesis, is not correct. So um, there's nothing that is inevitable about the existence and um, the evolution of artificial intelligence. I'm also not going to focus on this last um, 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 uh, thesis, I'm going to focus on the second one, which is, which is also the thesis that is central in the second chapter of my book, which is what I call the disruption thesis. The idea, the also um, a wide shared um, um, idea that AI, artificial intelligence, is a disruptive technology. So what is the idea? Well, the idea is that AI, artificial intelligence, disrupts and just like um, Uber, Airbnb, Tesla, 3D printing disrupt our uh, society or at least specific domains in our society. Of course, it's not a very old one. The neutrality thesis about the, neutral, the neutral character of, of technology is a very old one, more than 2,000 years old. But of course, the disruption thesis cannot be that old because yeah, AI is very young. But it's, at least it's very widespread. And um, it's a book that I, I, um, um, that I read in, um, it was written in um, 2008, at least it has been published in 2018. Uh, the, the name of the book is uh, Digitalis, um, written by Thierry Geertz. And there, at some point, he says that it is clear that the current digital revolution is radically changing our entire world and is turning everything upside down. Many people speak of disruption. The technological revolution disrupts the old world and makes it fall apart. That's like in a very uh, yeah, general um, description of the disruption thesis. I think there are at least some reasons to be critical about this um, idea. Now, we, we know, for example, the toothbrush from Oral-B uh, that is equipped with artificial intelligence it can be useful, it can be, uh, it can be very uh, nice to have this kind of toothbrush, but it's very questionable whether this kind of technology has a disruptive character and that it has some revolutionary character. That's very questionable. At the same time, there are also at least one reason to believe that it, is, that it could be correct. I mean, there are, all, there are technologies that don't have, uh, that are not equipped with uh, artificial intelligence, the real and the printing press, which did have a very um, disruptive and re revolutionary character in our society, in the world, right? If it is true that these uh, non-intelligent uh, non um, technologies could have a disruptive revolutionary character, then it could also be the case that um, smart technologies, artificial intelligence can have a disruptive character. So on the one hand, there's reasons to be critical, but there's also a reason to support the idea of a disruption thesis. Um, before um, finishing my um, introduction, the, 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 the expression of disruptive technology has been coined in um, 1995 by a scientist, Clayton Christensen, and he interpreted the idea of disruptive technology in an economical sense. And it was the idea that um, technology and yeah, sometimes also um, artificial intelligence has an effect on, an, on a specific domain, economy, and that the effect is that it, it created something new. And more precisely, the new effect that it had, had a revolutionary disruptive um, character. And it turned that specific domain 
upside down. It broke it up. Yeah, there was some something like a, a, a gap in that specific domain that has been constituted by the technology. That's that was the original idea. You could um, and you could focus um, on the disruptive character of technology in an economic sense, but also in a political sense, but also at the domain of war. And you could say, for example, that for uh, that for example, killer robots are disruptive technologies technologies at that specific level. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to focus on these other uh, domains, but I'm going to focus on the moral and ethical level. And so then the idea is that AI, artificial intelligence, has a disruptive effect on ethics. But that, of course, is still pretty vague. There are several interpretations of that, uh, of that idea, and I'm going to focus on this specific interpretation of the uh, disruptive character of, tech, of AI on the ethical level, saying that AI, smart technologies, create a totally new moral problems. So moral, because it focuses on the ethical level and totally new, that is my interpretation of the disruptive character of AI. But is it true? Is it correct? Is it correct that artificial intelligence creates totally new um, problems? Well, before we, if we, if we want to answer uh, that kind of question, um, the one way to tackle the question or to try to answer the question is to, to focus on a couple of, let's say, six problems that are often related to artificial intelligence. That the artificial intelligence can be misused by terrorists, for example. It can be used in order to create or to uh, prepare and etc. cetera, um, terrorist attacks. It, of course, that's pretty known. It, it, there are a lot of privacy issues that are related to artificial intelligence, of course, and that's probably the biggest issue. It, is, it has a biased character. There are safety and security problems that are related to AI. There are transparency problems. Of course, not every kind of intransparency is a moral problem, but a lot of AI systems that are that do have an impact on human beings and society that are at the same time in transparent the call, are, are morally problematic. And then six, the sixth sin, what I call, that is related to um, artificial intelligence is about ecology, about sustainability. Um, there are a lot of energy that is needed in order to uh, train the algorithms and the, the computers and in order to... the, the, the um, that we find that the computers that we find in data center, and there's a lot of there's an emission of greenhouse gases, gases that is pretty um, high. Yeah, so there are a lot of moral problems that are related and caused related to and caused by artificial systems. My point is yes, all of them are problems, and they are very serious problems. We we should try to prevent it. Uh, we should try to tackle it. We should be very conscious about these uh, moral issues, but none of these moral issues, none of these moral problems is totally new. So the transparency issue, the uh, sustainability, sustainability issue, the privacy issue are of course um, issues that are related, moral problems that are related to AI, but they, they don't cause a break. Yeah? They are, don't uh, put the, 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 at the level of um, moral philosophy at the ethical level, they don't put the world upside down. So we don't have to think at the ethical level in terms of discontinuity. We have to think in a gradual sense. So the, the problems that are related, um, the moral problems that are related to smart systems are nothing but a, a mere uh, intensification of already existing problems. They are not creating totally new problems. That's my point. At least until this slide. And that's my, um, my focus for today. Maybe there is something else. So maybe the, are, the, these six first moral problems are not totally new, but maybe there is something new that is related to moral responsibility. And there has been a philosopher, um, several philosophers, but the, the term, the notion has been um, coined by, a, I think, a German uh, philosopher, Andreas Matthias, who once wrote a text wherein he introduces the, the notion of the responsibility gap. Uh, what is the idea? Well, if you decide as a government, as a, a company, as a human being, 
to use and to implement uh, an artificial system, uh, artificial um, intelligence. And that system, that smart system, um, creates a problem or um, kills an innocent human being, for example, in the case of a killer robot and in the case of an autonomous car. Um, well, once um, the human being decides to use that system and the system makes a mistake, nobody can be held responsible for that mistake. That's the idea. So maybe we are, um, we want to, uh, we desire to punish a human being, but that wouldn't be justified. There is nobody, there is nobody who can be punished for a mistake made by the artificial system. That's, I, that's the idea, according to um, Andreas Matthias, but also, for example, according to uh, Andre, um, Robert Sparrow, an Australian philosopher, ethicist who wrote on killer robots and the responsibility gap. Um, that would be, according to uh, Andreas Matthias, that would be, first, it would be a problem. So if we are not able to punish or reward a human being in case of a mistake, in, in case of something that is positive, if we are not able to hold someone responsible, that is morally problematic. And second, um, it is not only problematic, it's also a new kind of problem. It, it is a kind of problem that didn't exist before the introduction of the implementation of artificial intelligence. Um, if that is true, but it's conditional, if that is true, that would be an argument in case of in, in favor of the disruption thesis. Because yeah, the, my interpretation of the disruption thesis was about yes, AI, artificial intelligence creates totally new problems. It would be then the seventh sin next to sustainability, etc. And it would be a totally new problem. My question is, um, what are the arguments in favor of the responsibility gap? And can we think, or can we believe, can we accept that idea of a responsibility gap? Before, before we are able to, to, um, to answer that question, we first have to focus on a couple of notions, at least two of them. Um, first, it's about, um, completely autonomous uh, systems. Uh, for example, already referred to them, self-driving cars, but also killer robots. These are autonomous systems, and autonomous in a, in, a, in, a, in a specific sense, in a twofold sense, first in a negative interpretation of autonomy, in the sense that once a human being, and of course, all, they all have been created by human beings, but once a human being uh, decides to push the button between brackets, decides to use the, the system, that system that robots that AI system can function completely independent from any kind of human intervention. So the killer robot can, can sit here next to me and the, the robot can detect a terrorist in the neighborhood of about, or in the, uh, maybe five kilometers from here. He can detect it, um, fly to the, the terrorist, but at, at that point he can, um, can uh, shoot and, and come back and again, take follow the presentation, etc. So the robot is the robot is, is able to to function completely autonomous, autonomously, uh, 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 yeah, independently from human interventions. The second interpretation of the um, the autonomous character of of a self driving car is is a more positive one. It's by the idea that uh, more than just um, being able to function independently, it's also that they can um, make decisions on their own. So the, the actions, the interventions of the robot are not pre-programmed by the engineer, by the AI developer. Yeah, of course, an AI developer, developer or an engineer has been uh, involved in the creation of the system, but the system itself is able to uh, make decisions based upon, of course, on the algorithms. And it's not that they are just following the rules that has been written down in the system by the engineer. That's a more positive um, that's a more positive interpretation of the autonomous character of um, an AI system. A second uh, clarification is about the idea of responsibility. And that is crucial here because if we if we use well if we use the term the word responsibility, um, we can refer to we can refer to uh, several state of affairs. So in other words, there are um, several interpretations of responsibility. The only the, the second one is relevant for my point about the responsibility gap. What is the first interpretation? Well, it's about the it's a causal, purely descriptive um, um, 
interpretation. Causal responsibility means that an agent, for example, a human being, an animal that is not a human being or a robot or something else, plays a role in a specific state, in a, in a specific uh, chain of events. So a robot can be responsible in a purely causal sense, since that robot, robot for example, uh, kills a human being, in the case of a killer robot. So the robot can be held responsible, of course, not in a moral sense, but only in a purely descriptive causal sense, in the sense that this robot played a role in the chain of events, namely in the event of uh, killing another human being. The third um, 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 kind of uh, responsibility is what we call role responsibility, and that idea refers to um, the, the, the set of duties that is related to a specific role or function. So as a father, for example, I am responsible, meaning that I have a lot, that are some duties that are related to my role, my function as a father. Yeah? I, need to I need to create a safe um, um, environment in which my uh, child can uh, grow up. That's, that's a role responsibility. Of course, as an engineer, I also have a role responsibility. I have a lot of knowledge about ma um, mathematics and about artificial systems. And I should, um, um, as an engineer, it's my um, duty to use that knowledge, that scientific knowledge, in order to create, in a responsible sense, that technology. Um, but the most relevant one is about is a, is the second interpretation of responsibility. What is moral responsibility? Um, well, a general, and I think, and uh, by a lot of uh, an interpretation that is shared by a lot of people is that. A human being is morally responsible when he or she is the candidate for a, a rewarding or a punishment. Yeah? So you are responsible for something in a moral sense, meaning that um, if we think that it's necessary to punish someone because something negatively uh, happened, then you are the one who should be punished. Or if something positive happened, um, you are morally responsible for that positive outcome, meaning that you are the one who should be rewarded by someone else. Yeah? Um, the idea is that someone is a candidate, meaning that candidate for punishment, meaning that if we believe that someone needs to be punished, it is justified to punish that human being. If, it is, of course, not necessary if you are morally responsible that you need to be punished, but if you believe it is necessary, to, to punish someone, and you are more responsible, then you are the candidate for that punishment. Well, the responsibility gap is about um, the idea that when a robot makes a mistake, um, there's no one who can be held responsible. Well, the idea is that it's about the second one. It's not about the first one. It's not about the third one. It's about the second one. So the idea is, well, the responsibility gap is a problem that has been, that is, accompanying um, the use and the implementation of AI systems, meaning that in case a self-driving car or a killer robot or something else makes a mistake, nobody is a candidate for a punishment. That's the idea. The idea is not that there is no causal responsibility. Of course not. When a robot uh, makes a mistake, then of course the robot is causally responsible for that mistake, only in a causal, purely descriptive and neutral sense. And of course, it's, not, it's also not about role responsibility. The AI systems, uh, the, the, the implementation and the use of, of AI systems is of course accompanied with a role responsibility. It's not, and it's not about a decrease of or, or the, the absence of role responsibility. On the other hand, um, moreover, it's about the increase and the, the presence of role responsibility. Once we, 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 uh, we, we uh, use and, and, and make and produce AI systems, um, there's always someone who is, um, uh, who, who has some role responsibility, who has the knowledge and who else, uh, who, who is obliged to, to use that knowledge when creating that system. And, that, and therefore we should say that um, the use of autonomous systems is still accompanied with role responsibility. So the, the, the point is about moral responsibility. So now we have an, we have an idea about the, the interpretation of the, the, the idea of, role of, of uh, uh, moral, the responsibility gap. Um, but before we can answer the question whether or not um, it is true that nobody can be held responsible in a moral sense, 
we should have a look at the conditions. We should have a look at the conditions. So the first question was, like in the previous slide was, what is the meaning of, of, of moral responsibility? What is moral responsibility? It's about being a candidate for punishment and reward. But here the question is, what are the conditions for being held morally responsible? So what, what are the conditions that need to be met in order to um, assign moral, morally, uh, moral responsibility? Well, um, there are, like traditionally, there are um, three conditions for moral responsibility. First, it's pretty obvious, is that there should be a causal link. So if there is no causal link uh, between you and the positive or uh, negative outcome, the positive or negative effect uh, of something that it, of, of an intervention, of, of uh, the intervention of a robot, for example, then if there's no causal link, you cannot be held responsible. There should be at least a direct or maybe also, maybe even an indirect link between you and what happened in a negative or in a positive sense. That's pretty clear to me. But of course, um, a causal link is a necessary but insufficient condition for moral responsibility. So the, the mere presence of causal link is insufficient to hold someone morally responsible. There should be at least two other conditions. The second one is about autonomy. There's a second necessary condition for moral responsibility. Um, if, if you're not an autonomous um, um, human being, if you don't have the, 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 the possibility to think for yourself and to decide for yourself based upon some um, 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 reasoning, moral reasoning, you cannot be held. You cannot be held responsible for um, for what happened and for the thing um, that happened in a positive or negative uh, sense. So, if, if if you are deciding or if you think that something should happen, of that this autonomous system should be used, but at the same time someone else is holding a gun against your head, there is no autonomy at that point. Autonomy is really needed. Um, we, should be, we should be able to, to reason and to decide based upon their own, our own autonomous, uh, the autonomous character over our, our own um, moral reasoning. And the last and third um, necessary condition for moral responsibility is the epistemic condition is, is about knowledge. You can only, um, you can only be, held, be held responsible in the moral sense when you, are, when you have all the relevant knowledge that is related to the action and the decision that is related to the outcomes and um, the positive or the negative outcomes. So if we weren't able to foresee the pos positive or negative outcome of a decision, we cannot be held responsible for that decision. That was, that's pretty clear. If, there's, it wasn't, if it wasn't possible at all to think about or to foresee the outcome, then you cannot be held responsible for that outcome. So that's the a, that's a condition that also needs to be met. So that, these are the three traditional, um, um, all of them are um, on the self um, 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 necessary, but insufficient. But if you take them together, normally they are seen in a traditional um, or by a lot of philosophers and ethicists, they are seen as sufficient conditions for moral responsibility. However, and that's um, near the end of my presentation. However, um, for those, those who, who argue in favor of um, the moral responsibility, um, there is a, um, um, a fourth um, um, necessary condition that needs to be met. Yeah. Exa um, according to uh, Andreas Matthias, for example, he argues that if you are not, if you don't have control over the decisions made by the system, you cannot be held responsible for that system in a moral sense. Um, and so, since we don't have control over the decisions made by the self-driving car, for example, of the decision or the decisions made by the killer robot, you may not. Uh, puni uh, punish uh, a human being, the human being that decided to use that system, because he or she didn't have control anymore over the system once once you once he or she um, decided to push the button. Um, that's at least the argument given by um, 
uh, Andreas Matthias and, for example, also um, Robert Sparrow. But I think it's in a one way or another, it is, uh, it's going against uh, our moral practice. Um, policymakers um, can be held responsible. Um, policymakers or ministers can be held responsible for the mistakes made by those who are working for the minister, for example. Yeah? Even though the minister doesn't have or didn't have any control over the decisions made by those working for the minister. So the moral practice, our daily moral practice, and in a political sense, for example, but also in companies, our daily moral practice shows that people can be held responsible, even though they are not, um, if, even if they don't have fully control over their um, actions and decisions. Of, even though they don't, they didn't have fully control over the actions for which they have been held responsible. Um, there is also the ID um, um, experimental situation, for example, artificial experimental situation. Um, take, for example, that I'm a epileptical patient, for example, and I have to go to to a, to a party, and it, it's raining, and therefore I'm taking um, the car, for example. Um, I'm taking the car. And I'm fully aware that I uh, am a patient. And once I started my car, I'm driving my car. And after five minutes, I become the, uh, I'm suffering from an epileptic attack. Meaning, or the consequence is that I lose control over the, of the car. And my car is um, hitting then uh, someone who is um, someone, someone else's car, or maybe someone who is um, cycling or just walking on the street. Consequence is that the people uh, driving uh, the car or walking on the street or cycling um, are injured and need to go to the hospital. Um, I'm not saying that a lot of people will say that you should be punished for it, but at least um, a lot of people will say that you can be held in a moral sense, be responsible. You can be held responsible in a moral sense for what happens. It's not necessary that you should be punished, but you can be held responsible. Why? Well, you knew that you, um, you were patient and you knew that it could happen that you lose control over your car. So for one reason, for one, uh, for one reason or another, because it was raining, because you really wanted to go to the party, you decided to take a risk. And once you take the decision in order to take a risk, or if you make the decision to take a risk, you can be held responsible for the risk. So. That experimental situation shows us again for the second time that people can be held responsible. And that's at least, I think, our moral intuition, that people can be held responsible even though there was no um, full direct control over the action over the car. Um, well, I think that that kind of framework um, can be used in order to deal with um, artificial systems even though we don't have fully control over the uh, killer robot or autonomous cars, self-driving cars, at least, I don't know who, that it's not my point here, but at least one human entity, one human being can be held responsible even though there was no control anymore. I think that all of the conditions are met, the three traditional conditions. Um, for example, as, a, as, a, as an officer, for example, I decide to uh, use a killer robot so that there is a causal link there was no pressure. Uh, there was the, 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 the second autonomy condition has been met. And also I was fully aware of the possible negative and positive effects that may follow out of the use of a killer robot. So the three traditional conditions are met. The fourth condition about control isn't necessary. And so even though there is no um, full control, direct control over the system, there is someone who can be held responsible. The user, the officer, the soldier, the minister, Etc. So, um, if it is true, but if it is true, indeed, indeed, again, a conditional, if it is true that um, a responsibility gap is a problem, a moral problem, second, if it is true that um, a responsibility gap is a new problem, it is still not, we, we still don't have an, an argument in favor of the disruption thesis. Um, why? Well, I think that. The use and the implementation of autonomous systems of artificial intelligence isn't accompanied by the existence of responsibility gap. 
Now, there are only six sins when you talk about AI. There, no, there is no seven uh, sin. So AI is disruptive technology. It's a very often uh, heard uh, um, thesis. It can be interpreted in many ways. And it, can, and it is often uh, proclaimed by optimists saying that um, the use of technology will create totally new opportunities, but also a lot about pessimists in the sense that uh, techno AI, artificial systems, uh, will create totally new problems. Well, I don't think it's true. Uh, I don't think so there are a lot of problems, at least six problems, but none of these problems is new. And the seventh possible candidate for the, uh, uh, the disruption thesis isn't even, uh, maybe it is a problem, but there is no responsibility gap when we talk about artificial intelligence. To finish my talk, um, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I think there are at least six problems, not seven problems, but maybe I did forget something. Or maybe within 10 or 12 years or 20 years or 50 years, there will be totally new moral problems that has been created by the existence of and the use of autonomous systems. But up until now, I don't think at least when you interpret that thesis the way I did it, there's no reason to believe that AI is disruptive at a moral level. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, Welcome. Load. Um, Yes, I have several questions, but uh, the audience is also welcome to ask uh, uh, questions in the chat uh, or in the YouTube. And Alexander, that is supporting us, will uh, transfer the question in the Zoom chat. Um, okay. So I, I have a question uh, myself. So, um, why, uh, how? When do you consider artificial intelligence has, was born? I mean, um, are the, the question you address related to artificial intelligence or related to the fact that human can think about themselves in a way? This capacity of self-reference is the basis of uh, of the thinking, the consciousness, and 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 many things like that. So. Um, uh, is it really different? Because uh, when we, when we speak about the golem, when we speak about uh, uh, Promete, for example, we mm -hmm. have this idea to create uh, from from inanimate uh, Pinocchio, uh, mm -hmm. create uh, someone with a conscious. Uh, so so it is artificial intelligence. So when begins your your view on artificial intelligence, or what do you consider? Is it is it clear as a question? Not really. Okay. So, the, your, is your question how do you understand artificial intelligence? Is that a question? Yeah. Yeah. In so I, I here understand um, understand artificial intelligence not in the good old, not as a go find not as the good old fashioned um, um, good old fashioned AI. So I'm not referring to expert systems. I'm not referring to those artificial systems that are equipped um, with rules that are pre-programmed by the expert, for example, the, the doctor, uh, the medical expert into the system. Because at that point, you could say that there is no real intelligence. Um, there's no real intelligence. The, the, the system is only following the rules that has been inscribed in the system. It's kind of a reflex. Um, mm -hmm. So I, 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 I refer... Um, mostly to those systems that are function, functioning based upon um, machine learning and then, of course, more uh, specifically, most of the time, deep learning. So that meaning that it's not always possible to foresee what the outcome will be, which, which is the case, by the way, for the more traditional systems. If you, are, if you have expert system, then the, the end result, the decision, can be foreseen. We are more or less 100% sure what the end decision will be. Mm -hmm. uh, often, which is not the case if you work with um, with um, artificial intelligence in the sense of machine learning and deep learning. Okay, okay. That I was referring to the fact that indeed there are some fundamental questions: where are we coming from? And uh, uh, so people are working on, on the origin of universe and and the the 
the other question is how the human was born. So artificial intelligence at the end is uh, working on, uh, okay, what, how human intelligence was born. Um, and, and um, okay, um, I understand that you focus on the machine learning aspect. So yesterday we talked with uh, Anu Kuiprecht, uh, who was um, presenting us uh, one its uh, dresses and 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 all the the captors she can have on a human body, and um, uh, this embodiment. Uh, do you integrate this embodiment in your reflection? Meaning, neural links aspects. Meaning. Uh, we can have a feedback and many data about our behavior and then uh, augment our perception of what's happening out yeah. there. And okay, uh, how have you included that in your reflection? But that is, that is of course also included and because, and, and also, mm -hmm. uh, especially because it's uh, immediately relevant to the responsibility. So I, I think that the more um, accurate, the more precise, the more fine a system can work with the help of feedback, etc. the more um, the system can be held responsible for, uh, or the more, no, sorry, the more uh, we, the, at least we can help, we hold someone responsible for the system. So of course I included it because it's immediately re related to my, my thesis about the responsibility gap. Yeah, okay. So I see maybe a question here from Danai Skivy. Could you further elaborate the idea? Can someone be held legally responsible while at the same time cannot be held morally responsible? Should we differentiate these two forms of responsibility when examining responsibility gap in general? Yeah, uh, thank you, Danai, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, of course, um, good question. Um, so I'm not a legal expert, so I'm... I'm um, I cannot that, say that much about it, but at the, at the same time, I know that in, in a lot of cases, and there's an overlap between moral and legal responsibility, but at the same time, we, we should, um, um, and should, should keep them separated. I mean, you can be held responsible in a moral sense without being held in a legal, without, without being held responsible in a legal sense. Uh, to cheat on your girl or boyfriend, for example, um, is morally problematic. At the same time, it's not legally problematic. So there is a distinction. Um, I can think of um, I can think of um, um, AI developers that help that that can be held responsible for a mistake at a moral level because they didn't take into account this or that knowledge that is able that is necessary in order to develop the system. But at the same time, I can also think about the same AI developer who cannot be held responsible in the legal sense since that um, action and intervention was not captured by the law. So in that sense, you could say that maybe there's a gap, uh, maybe there's a gap in the legal system. So he or she cannot be held responsible in the legal sense, but still he or she can be held responsible in the moral sense. So then the moral responsibility is, is some kind of extra element that is, that is needed and that is there in order to fill the gap in order to fill the gap in the legal system. So if, if, if your question was done, I to, to elaborate on that distinction, I think there is a distinction. One can be held responsible in a moral sense without being held in the legal, moral um, without being held responsible in legal sense. And at that point, you could say that, what is the specific relation? Well, the moral responsibility is some kind of instrument, is some kind of um, um, instrument that we, that we have, that we invented, in order to fill the gap in the legal system, that you could—that's that's that would be my point. And maybe the the moral responsibility uh, will not will never be replaced by the legal responsibility, but if it will be replaced by the legal um, responsibility, think about think about the, the system, uh, the the, um, the implementation of uh, mines, for example. Um, if it will be uh, replaced by the legal responsibility, then the moral uh, responsibility is, is some kind of um, instrument that can be used until the legal responsibility replaces the moral responsibility. It, it, it fills the gap in the legal system, you could say. 
that would be my my uh, reply. Uh, Danai, d- does it help you? I hope so. Um, so I, I, yeah. Okay. Can can the people have the floor here or or not in this session? Okay. So maybe. Okay. Um, another question, maybe related to the the proposal of AI Act. Uh, do you have some some remark or do you have a, a position paper related to to your thesis here um it is not the uh, same level of... no i'm not gonna focus on that um, no. no i'm not gonna focus on that um i i once wrote an opinion piece with a colleague and christians a couple of uh, once it was a couple of five six months ago and it was about the AI Act. That, of course, is something that is, uh, of course, well, I think that is desirable. Mm-hmm. But of course, there are still some gaps in it. Um, there's still some gaps in it. There's still some things that need to be uh, supplemented uh, in order to make it workable and in order to make it workable in an ethical sense, in a desirable sense. Yeah. Okay, so then I was... Uh happy with your answer. So we have many people from from Europe here. Uh, Blazej, Eru, uh, maybe uh, there are some collaborators you know. Um, yeah, okay. I recognize a couple of names. <laughs> At least two of them. Uh, okay, so um, we will have in... Uh, in the next session at at uh, at 7 p.m., uh, this is a citizen debate uh, uh, organized by Le Wagon um, at Bicentrale, and the the topic of the citizen debate is uh, can we trust AI? So uh, Alexander, I've put the the link um, there, so you you can follow it at, at seven. I will. Would like to thank you very much for this uh, very uh, clear um, speech and, thank and you, structured Nathana. speech. Thanks also for the invitation. Uh, um, and then, if we can talk, maybe uh, just just after it will be great uh, when when we cut here streaming. Okay. And I, I remind you also that at eight p.m. Uh, we have Boris Cyrulnik uh, yeah. that will talk about uh, brains and yeah. memories. That's so right. I think uh, that's worth uh, uh, attending. Okay. So thank you very much. And you're see welcome. You soon. And um, I, I want to thank everybody for listening. And for those interested in my book, you send me an email, send me an email to my uh, email address, and I can send you a copy of my book. Great. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.